and has also served as president of the Superior Electoral Board. Justice Barroso graduated in law from Universidade de Estado de Janeiro, has a master's degree in law by Yale University and PhD from UERJ, being a professor of constitutional law in, in university while all, also doing his postgraduate studies in Harvard Law School. Professor Stephen Levitsky is the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University. As a David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government, his research focuses on democratization, authoritarianism, political parties, and weak and informal institutions. He's author of How Democracies Die. Justice Luis Roberto Barroso will start and offer his initial reflections for 10 minutes, and then we'll have an open conversation between the speakers. At the end, we will open for questions from the audience. Thank you. Should I start, Manuela? Yes, please. OK. So hello, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I thank the organizers for the invitation. And I thank Steve uh, for being here and participating with us in, in this uh, conversation. It's the second time we are uh, on the same panel. Uh, and I always had to do it in English. And uh, <laughs> so I, it's more difficult for me, believe I'm, me. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> But someday you're going to do it in, in Portuguese. Uh, so in, in these uh, initial remarks, I, I'm going to establish uh, the basic concept of democracy, of constitutional democracy we're going to uh, work with. And then I, I want to say uh, why I think democracy was the prevailing ideology in the 20th century. And then we move on to discuss a little bit the state of the art of democracy in the world uh, these uh, days. So starting from the beginning, uh, constitutional democracy is, it's horrible to talk about this, mess. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the institutional arrangement that combines uh, two ideas, two different ideas that had different trajectories over the years, constitutionalism and democracy. Constitutionalism is heir to the liberal revolutions and basically means separation of power, separation of powers and protection of fundamental rights. On the other hand, democracy means popular sovereignty and the rule of majority. Democracy was only consolidated when the 20th century was advanced and all the restrictions involving uh, race, gender, wealth and religion were dismissed. Most constitutional democracies have either a Supreme Court or a constitutional court, whose role is to arbitrate tensions that exist between democracy and fundamental rights, democracy and constitutionalism. Because the role of the courts, the main role of the courts is to protect the rules of democracy and to protect fundamental rights, even against the will of the majority. So this is constitutional democracy. Now, this is suffocating. <laughs> I, I've taken four vaccines, uh, Steve, so. <laughs> two, yeah, two in Brazil. AstraZeneca and two here, Pfizer. So um, if, if I sneeze, I might cure someone. <laughs> so uh, democracy uh, was, as I said before, the prevailing ideology of the 20th century, having defeated all the alternatives that presented themselves. Communism, fascism, Nazism, military regimes, and uh, religious fundamentalisms. And by the end of the 20th century, the, there was that famous article and book by Francis Fukuyama, The End of History, proclaiming that uh, liberal democracy was the culmination of the possible institutional arrangements in the world and liberal democracy had won and history had ended. Uh, his revisited that text. Uh, well, what happened then? 
is that these days there seems to be something going wrong. And there are multiple examples throughout the world of this scenario that authors have been referring as democratic recession, democratic backsliding, abusive constitutionalism, or autocratic legalism. The examples are multiple, as I said. Hungary, Poland, Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, moving to Latin America, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and more recently, El Salvador. In these countries, as Steve uh, brilliantly points out in, in his book, there has been the erosion of democracy, but the main shift these days is that democracy does not fall under the arms, the guns of generals and his or her soldiers, but elected leaders, elected by popular vote, are the ones re responsible for the erosion of democracy. After being elected, brick by brick, sometimes very slowly, they deconstruct the pillars of democracy by concentrating power in the executive, by persecuting leaders of the opposition, by demonizing the press, by changing the rules of the game with abuse of power by majorities, and very importantly, packing the courts with submissive judges. So this is a pattern that you'll find in different parts of uh, the world. So, and coming to the, my final remarks, at this initial remarks, uh, what's going on? I think we can talk about three different phenomena that are concurrently underway in different parts of the world. And they are populism, extremism, and authoritarianism. And this is the main chapter of my initial remarks, and I will hand over soon to Steve and have his comments on this. Uh, populism, extremism, and authoritarianism are different things. The problem is when they come together, as it has happened in different parts of the world. Populism takes place when charismatic leaders manipulate the needs and the fears of the population, usually offering simple and misguided solution to complex problems and presenting themselves, the popular leaders, as different from everything that's out there. They present themselves as anti-establishment. And they usually use the same strategies, which are direct communication with their supporters, dividing society between we the people and then the elites, that's one typical characteristic. The second is bypassing intermediate institutions or co-opting them. Legislature, the press, civil society organizations. And thirdly, and very important, uh, for me at least, they attack fiercely the courts. Supreme Courts and Constitutional Courts that have the role of limiting power. That's the role of a Constitutional Court, of a Supreme Court. The Constitution limits the power of the government, and the role of a Supreme Court is to interpret the Constitution, meaning the role of a Supreme Court is to limit political power in, in any uh, democracy. Extremism is characterized by 
intolerance and aggressiveness toward the other, towards the different. It's uh, an anti-pluralistic way of seeing life and, and doing uh, politics, often combining it with threats and violence. Extremism can be from one side of, or the other of the political spectrum, although what we see in the world, more generally, is the rise of far-right extremism. This is what's going on mainly in, in Europe, I'd say. And finally, authoritarianism is a ghost that has always haunted different parts of the world, especially in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and even in some countries of Europe. Uh, it involves the permanent temptation of concentrating power in the executive, weakening the legislature, weakening uh, courts, and it usually comes with violence against the opponents, press censorship, and rigged elections. Extremism, authoritarianism, and populism makes, make extensive use these days of social media to spread hate, misinformation, and conspiracy theories. It has been like this in different parts of the world. So this is a brief description of how I see the whole picture of democracy in the world today. Brazil and the US are in the world. <laughs> so now uh, we are going to hear uh, Steve's comments on this picture, how it has impacted the US, how he thinks it impacts Brazil and uh, Latin America. So I did the easy part, which was <laughs> describing the scenario. So now he is going to write the, the, the script. Uh, and I am assuming his crystal ball is better than mine. Uh, when we met three years ago in Inspire in Sao Paulo, I was a bit more optimistic than him. Than him. Uh, but I think he was right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Steve, thanks. Thanks for being here. Look, uh, first of all, and most importantly, can I keep this? <laughs> <laughs> I love this stuff. <laughs> um, okay. It's, it's your sponsor? It's no oh, okay. Sponsor. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I don't need to, I'm not advertising, but I love this stuff. <laughs> um, uh, let me be brief and, and just make a couple of general points, and then if you want to, we can follow up with specifics about Brazil and the United States. Um, I... That was pretty amazing, that summary of 100 years of democracy and its, and its opponents in 12 minutes. I, <laughs> I, I could not do that. A um, couple of points. First of all, uh, although the, the democratic backsliding that you point to, Roberto, across the world is, is real, I think we should put it into context. It's, um, the number of democracies in the world today is about equal to the number of democracies that existed in uh, the early 2000s, about 15 or 20 years ago. And it is more, there are more democracies, there are in fact considerably more democracies in the world today than there were in the 1990s when um, Francis Fukuyama wrote The End of History. So there was a dramatic, dramatic expansion of democracy in the world beginning in the 70s and 80s, taking off in the 1990s, particularly after the collapse of, of the Soviet Union, uh, and then there has basically been a leveling off with some slight backsliding in terms of the number of overall democracies in the world over the last decade. Um, given that, given changes in the world in the last 15 or 20 years, given the uh, decline in power and prestige of the United States and, and, and Western Europe, meaning the, the decline in the economic, military, ideological power of the liberal West compared to the 1990s, it's a dramatic decline. Given the, uh, the aggressiveness of Russia and the expanding power of China, given that we've basically gone from a, a, a period of Western liberal hegemony in the mid-1990s, which is the best possible international environment, the best environment for, for democracy in world history, from, a, from there to where we are now, um, where the, the United States is incapable of promoting democracy, even within its own borders. Um, Given that, 
the, the, the amount of backsliding in the world, there are maybe two or three less democracies, fewer democracies today than there were in 2005. It's actually not that bad. Democracies in many respects are performing pretty well. Mo the fact that most, for all of their warts, for all of their problems, for all of their limitations, for all of their crises, most Latin American democracies survive. Whether it's Brazil or Peru or Argentina, Panama, they survive. Um, a couple of points about sort of what's going on and particularly uh, the rise of populism. And I think you do point to something important in, in, with populism. Populists um, almost invariably challenge liberal dem democratic institutions. And there, are, there do seem to be more populists around today, more populists getting elected today than ever before in the past. And uh, I think you're right about that. And I want to just go down that road a little bit. Popu the reason why populists challenge liberal democratic institutions, I guess there are a bunch of them, but one of them is that they earn a mandate to basically destroy the established elite. Populists campaign for votes. They mobilize people on the idea that the, the established elite, from left-wing intellectuals to right-wing business people, and everybody in between, is corrupt, conspiring, oligarchic, undemocratic, and up to no good. And that they are... Um, that they have turned their back at best on the people. Um, and so what populists do in, in one way or another is tell voters that they will take the entire elite, again, from left-wing intellectuals to right-wing business people with all the parties in between, put them in a bag and throw them in the Charles River or whatever river is closest by. <laughs> that, that, that's the promise of populism. Unfortunately, and I'll get back to this in a second, that's often a pretty attractive appeal, right? Uh, political elites across Latin America and across much of the world are not terribly popular today. They range between pretty unpopular and really unpopular. And so a populist appeal has, often has a lot of success. When populists win, they come to power, in a, particularly in a, in a liberal democracy, in a liberal presidential democracy of the type that, uh, that Roberto is describing, and they come to power and almost invariably they face opposition from the very institutions that Roberto described. Almost invariably, the parties that they have railed against, the parties that they have promised to put in a bag and throw in a river, control the Senate or they control the Congress. Their appointees sit on the Supreme Court. And so you have come to power with a mandate to destroy the political elite, and yet that political elite controls Congress and the Supreme Court and, and other state agencies as well. Now, what do you do? You could be like Lula and you could govern with that elite. You, Lula, I do not consider a populist. Um, you could sit down and negotiate and build coalitions with that elite and govern with it for better and for worse. But that, for a populist, is a betrayal of your mandate. If your mandate is to destroy the elite, you cannot sit down on television, negotiate with them, build coalitions with them, govern with them, and get away with it. It's a betrayal of your mandate, and you end up in the street like Lucio Gutierrez, or you risk that. So populists have a political incentive to continue fighting the elite, and that means maybe threatening to close Congress, marginalizing Congress, packing the Supreme Court, trying to impeach Supreme Court justices, trying to, one way or another, gain control of these institutions and purge them of the old elite. Invariably, almost invariably, that leads to a conflict between the exec a populist executive and, a, and other branches of government which are controlled by, uh, by, by the old establishment, and that can go in various directions. Sometimes the president wins, sometimes the president loses. Almost invariably, democratic institutions are shaken, if not broken. So populism... Um, uh, is double-edged, it's, it's not all problematic for democracy, but a successful populists do almost invariably assault democratic institutions. Perón did, Fujimori did, Chavez did, Correa did, uh, Morales did, Bukele is doing it, Trump tried, Bolsonaro's tried. Um, it, 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 there are very few cases of, of successful populists who don't assault democratic institutions. Why is populism more common today than it was in the past? Very, very quickly. I think the main reason, and, and Roberto alluded to it, is the weakening of political establishments. Political establishments consider them the sole, whole set of actors 
institutions, organizations with resources that politicians need to get elected. So three types, just to be very simple. Political parties control nominations for higher office, an important resource. Media controls access to voters, right? It, particularly if you think back in the past, you, they're, they're the ones that, 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 that reach voters. And interest groups, whether they be labor, business associations, what have you, control campaign resources. Primarily money, but also activists. If you go back 50 years, if you go back 40 years to the 1980s, those three actors, political parties, interest groups, and traditional media, basically monopolized the resources politicians needed to get elected. Right? If, if you were not on good terms with the political party prior to the, the 1970s, anywhere in the world, you couldn't, um, you couldn't get nominated because there were no primaries. The party leaders decided if you were going to be a candidate or not. If you were not on good terms with, with major interest groups, whether labor or business, in the 1970s, 1980s, you simply couldn't get the resources to run for office. And if you were not on good terms with the two or three television stations that existed, in the 1970s or 80s or the major newspapers, you either did not get coverage or you got heavily biased coverage and you could not reach voters. There was no way 50 years ago, whether it was Canada, Brazil, the United States, Belgium, Japan, what have you, there was virtually no way to build and sustain a career unless you were Juan freaking Perón um, to, get, to, build an, to, to, to get yourself elected without the acquiescence of the establishment. That has changed dramatically over the last 30, 40 years for reasons that, that, that you all know better than I do. Uh, parties have either weakened or internally democratized so that you can very easily become a candidate without a political party or you can hijack a political party as Trump did. Um, you can raise money uh, in multiple ways without going to traditional interest groups. Bernie freaking Sanders outraised Hillary Clinton in 2016. Bernie Sanders, an old Jewish socialist from Vermont, out fundraised Hillary Clinton and any up out fundraised Joe Biden. That's a new world. And of course, you can, um, you can reach voters through social media. You don't need the traditional media. I will very, very quickly tell you an anecdote that I'm pretty sure I told Roberto about my trip to Brazil. It, I went to Brazil in 2018. A couple of liberal Jewish businessmen brought me down to Sao Paulo to, because they saw Bolsonaro coming over the horizon. And they just read How Democracies Die. And they brought me down to convince their rich banker, Sao Paulista, Tucano, <laughs> friends, not to support Bolsonaro. They knew that the, that the second round with, uh, was coming. They knew their friends were going to back Bolsonaro. And they wanted to somehow convince them. Not, of course, I utterly failed. <laughs> but I went there, and I had these a ton of conversations with well-to-do uh, Paulistas, all of them Tucanos, all of them voting for Altman, all of them, Altman's at 4% in the poll. All of them believed that Altman was going to make it in the second round. They weren't very worried about Bolsonaro because they knew that Altman had a co an alliance with the Central, that he had God knows how many hours on, of, of free television time. Bolsonaro had only six seconds a day of TV. And everybody knew that eventually that support of the, the parties and this TV time was going to allow Altman to come back and Bolsonaro would lose. Nobody mentioned what's up in July 2018. It's a new world. It is easier to be a populist today than it was for at any other time in history. It is easier to run outside the establishment so as you don't have to conform to establishment norms, whether they be behavioral norms or they be policy parameters. It's easier to be an extremist. It's easier to, 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 uh, to, to, to violate all sorts of norms. And it's easier not only to be outside the establishment, it's easier to be anti-establishment than it was in the past. There was a real cost to be paid in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s to being outside the establishment. That cost has been reduced to, you know, if you've got a million followers on, on, on Facebook or Twitter like Bukele, that cost has been reduced to almost zero. It's just a lot easier to be a populist today. Let me stop there. Okay. Uh, I, I took some notes here. Uh, I, I basically agree with uh, everything that Steve has said. I just want to uh, point out a few uh, specific uh, issues. Uh, the first one is Steve said that there has not been any relevant reduction 
in the number of democracies in the world, which is true, but the quality of democracy decreased. So that's one point I think we should highlight. And then uh, we see for Brazil, like we should be talking about education, about innovation, about investments in science and technology. And we are discussing how to preserve democracy, if there will be or not a coup, and how can we deal with it. So although uh, democracies have survived, and Brazilians, uh, Brazilian democracy has been quite resilient, I think that the quality of the democracy, the quality of the debate has decreased substantially. And you know that concerns me because I'm discussing the wrong issues. Uh, I wanted to be discussing different things. That's, that's one point I, I want to stress. Uh, one other point is about populism and uh, far-right extremism is that there is kind of a backlash, kind of a resentment against the progressive achievements of the past decades the, of liberal governments that uh, Steve was mentioning. So they kind of motivated people that think that the agenda of uh, multi, the, the egalitarian, multicultural and cosmopolitan agenda that most of us profess, they, they feel like they were left behind. They think that this is a progressive agenda of human rights, of gay rights, of women's rights, of affirmative action, of environment. Taking vaccines. Taking <laughs> vaccines and, and, and uh, protecting native peoples. So th there is this kind of a backlash that they explore this resentment. And with it comes a resentment against knowledge, against culture, against science. And ignorance and mediocrity becomes a virtue in, in this world, which is uh, something that uh, really concerns everyone. Uh, the rise of social media, I, to be true, I've been studying this, I still don't have a uh, complete assessment of the impact of social media. In, in the 2018 election in Brazil, it had a major impact. And as Steve mentioned, the candidate that had the most of the television time placed fourth. So television in 2018 was not important. And WhatsApp, no, no one saw it was coming. He's right. And uh, there is a, a survey that shows that 79% of Brazilians have as their main source of information, what's up? Television comes second with 50%. So I, I wouldn't discard totally the role of television in the next elections. So it could be that social media really made a difference, very impressive difference in the 2018 elections. So let's wait and see what's gonna happen, especially because we are all better prepared to deal with social media and to deal with fake news or, or disinformation campaigns. It's not easy, uh, I can tell from my experience, but we learned, we know better how to deal with it. So it might be the case that it won't play such an important role again. And finally, and that's the most sophisticated point, Steve, uh, elites are not a uniform concept. There are different elites. You have extractivist elites, the ones that Asimoglu and Robinson describe in, in their book, Why Nations Fail. And we have plenty of that in Brazil. Like Brazil is a country, uh, Steve, you, you certainly know, where the poor pay more taxes than the rich. It's, it's unbelievable, but I, I was a lawyer for 30 years and I paid less income tax than my secretary. So it's, it's, it's difficult to explain to anyone what happens in Brazil. The good public universities were only accessible to upper classes uh, before we had this affirmative action programs. So this is what a extractivist elite uh, does to a country. But we have progressive elites. We have people doing science. We have people 
and that are concerned about knowledge. So you cannot uh, label elites as if you were dealing with something that's homogeneous. I think that's a, a very important uh, point I, I would like to, to make. So this artificial division that populists make between us, the people, pure, and those, the elites, uh, corrupt, uh, that just ain't true. Because elites are not just one. And from my experience, people are elected, populist leaders are elected with an anti-establishment discourse, that's true. But guess with whom they compromise as soon as they can? With the elites. And I live in Brazil and you don't have to look much farther. So uh, there is a contradiction uh, in, in this uh, process. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for here and I'll hand over to you and, and see your comments on, on, on these points. Uh, only very briefly that uh, it, it is certainly true analytically as a social scientist that you cannot uh, label elites as, as a homogeneous entity. But populists do it, and they do it effectively. And so what we need to better understand uh, with some urgency is why these appeals succeed and what under, the conditions under which a populist can put, again, an entire very heterogeneous elite in the same bag and, uh, and, and propose to toss them out and win 45, 50, even 50 plus percent of the vote in doing it. Well, how some politicians can earn an electoral mandate um, based on this division of society. And I don't think we fully understand that, that yet. I think uh, that the, the, I mean, part of it is this sort of supply side that I mentioned earlier, that it's easier to do, the technologies to do it are easier now, but there also clearly is a demand side. There's a reason why people are voting for populists. And I, I, even though social scientists have spent a lot of Time and energy in the last decade studying that question, I don't think we fully understand. And this is happening across, in rich countries, it's happening in middle income countries, it's happening in just about every region of, of the world. Uh, there is a, a quote by Stephen Holmes that I, I find interesting. I even wrote it down here. He says, democracy is about promising, disappointing, and managing the disappointment, which is a very good quote. And if you look at Brazil at, at this point, uh, the program, uh, Steve, that elected the president was an anti-corruption program. And Sergio Moro was the symbol of fighting corruption, and he was picked as Minister of Justice. It was a liberal agenda, liberal in the Brazilian sense and in the European sense, meaning uh, pro-business and, and against big government uh, and concerns with the, the fiscal deficit. Uh, some people say this promise hasn't been fulfilled. I, I, can, I cannot make political judgments, so I'm just describing facts. Uh, and uh, the other program, the other point in the program was to be against old politics, pork barrel politics clientelism. Some people might think it didn't happen. So we might have come to a point in which people are managing the disappointment and trying to figure where, where to go. So one thing that I think it's uh, certain about populism is that it will eventually fail. It just cannot work. First, because you offer simple and misguided answers to complex problems, and because eventually you have to compromise with the elite. And uh, when this time comes, people are trying to figure where to go. Uh, at a certain point in Brazil, Steve, 
Many people, including myself, were concerned about a coup d'etat. There, there were rallies in front of the army headquarters claiming for the shutdown of Congress and of the Supreme Court. There was this awkward parade of tanks before the, the Supreme Court. It released more smoke than the <laughs> Nissan stanza I had when I went to Yale 40 years ago. Uh, and there was this September 7th in, in Brazil. Before September 7th, everyone was very concerned with what could happen. Because they were calling everyone to go to the streets. They were expecting, Steve, like one million people in Brasilia and one, people, one million people in, in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, it was New Year's Eve, Jewish New Year's Eve. So I, I went to the synagogue. And when I went to the synagogue, it was like a Catholic procession. I had like 10 uh, cars following me for protection because they, they thought people would attack me. Well, there were only like 100,000 people in Brasilia and 100,000 people in Sao Paulo. That's, you know, it's a fairly good amount of people. But the military police didn't join the manifestation. The army, high rank generals, didn't endorse that. And there were much fewer people than they were expecting. So my assessment is that on September 7th, the coup d'etat was buried. There's no support for it. And if you pay attention, after that, the attacks to the Supreme Court ceased. The attacks to the electoral system ceased. The attacks to me ceased. <laughs> so uh, I think the September 7th was a moment where people realized that the far right didn't have a relevant majority to uh, destroy democracy. And so they decided, let's try to play by the rule of the game, by the rules of the game, which is, of course, much better than it was before. So uh, the good side of what I'm saying is, I think the risk of the coup was buried. And so I think uh, the institutions overcame the authoritarian extremist populism in, in Brazil. Of course, if they win the elections, that's the game. But the attempts and the threats to the institutions, I think they're gone. So I think if Steve writes a new book on Brazil, he can write how democracy survive because I think we did survive. What do you think? I hope you're not being uh, optimistic again. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, actually, I actually share your, your optimism on, on Brazil. Um, it, it does look, uh, Brazilian institutions are, um, are, are pretty strong. And it's not Finland, but um, by Latin American standards, Brazilian democratic institutions are pretty robust. And the, it's, it's never, ever, ever a good idea to elect an autocrat to the presidency. Um, but democracies can and do survive autocrats in the presidency. Um, so far, the United States did at least round one of Trump, and, and Brazil may as well. Um, and, and that raises, and you raise a very important point. And, and I think the jury is, I shouldn't raise, make uh, legal metaphors in, uh, in the law school, but, uh, <laughs> but I was going to say the jury is still out. This is, um, I, I don't think we know. I don't think we have the final answer in Brazil. But to, to really kill democracy, in many cases, you most cases, you need the military behind you. Like Trump could not pull off a presidential coup in the United States because he couldn't mobilize the military behind him, um, and and you know he learned that. Um, over the course of, of 2020, uh, his his September 7th was was obviously January 6th, 2021. Um, but 
you know, for, for Bukele to very quickly concentrate power in El Salvador, for Fujimori to carry out an auto golpe in Peru, it required a mobilization. The military is an ally. The military has to go along. And um, one of the great assets the United States has, as troubled and crisis ridden and threatened as US democracy is today, one of the great assets we have is, is highly institutionalized civilian control over the military. With, now, Brazil is not El Salvador, it's not Honduras, but Brazil has a long history of military intervention. And the military, military protagonism has expanded considerably in the last uh, few years. I've, I've had uh, various Congress people, Brazilian Congress people tell me that one reason why impeachment was never taken seriously in the Brazilian Congress is that um, there was a perception that of, a, of, a, of a military veto of it. Uh, the military has put its thumb on the scales in politics in the last five years in Brazil. Um, so there's very real concern that maybe Brazil, for all of its gains since the 1980s, is not quite like the United States. So far, though, so far it looks like um, the, the armed forces are not going to go along with a um, with an authoritarian adventure by, by Bolsonaro. I, one thing that I cannot figure out, and I don't know anybody in, the Bolsonaro, in Bolsonaro's inner circle, is why they insist on following a Trumpist strategy. Because if you're, you know, for any, anyone who's an aspiring autocrat out there, if you're going to be an aspiring autocrat, follow a model that works, not a model that fails. <laughs> and Trump failed, and yet Bolsonaro seems to insist on following a, a, a Trumpist model. And if he's, but, I mean, but Bolsonaro could make the Trumpist model succeed if he could mobilize the military. All signs that I've seen so far in, are in agreement with you, Roberto, that he's not going to be able to do it. And that is a very, very good sign. Yeah. Well, I, I think you're totally right. The, the military played uh, an important role in Brazil since the beginning of the republic. Actually, the republic in Brazil was a military coup against the constitutional emperor that was a, an enlightened man. Uh, and then we started you know, having problems with the first military government, uh, the first with Deodoro and then Floriano uh, that stayed in power when he should have called for elections. And so uh, yes, we do have a tradition of uh, military intervention. I think you're right. But the good thing I, I think I can say is that as of 1988, to be true, they played a exemplary role in Brazilian democracy. And I can say that uh, very comfortably because I, I was opposed to the military regime. I was in, in very mobilized, not clandestine, but very mobilized against the military regime at my time in, in law school and, and in, in the 80s. But we must acknowledge that if there is an area uh, where we didn't get bad news coming from what was the military in the post-1988 uh, era in, in Brazil. That, that's just to be, to be fair. With Bolsonaro, you were right, uh, the military uh, recovered an importance uh, in politics that they should not have. And many positions were filled with military, and, and I myself said once to their dismay that that was Chavez's playbook, filling uh, civil uh, places and important places with the, with the military. But again, to be true, although they are out there, nothing bad has happened. And more than that, if I can say that, uh, I like I'm not a political actor. I'm an institutional actor, so I try not to make any political judgments because it's not proper. But if you read what was written about the firing of the Minister of Defense was precisely because, so the press said and other people said, because he was not prepared to allow the armed forces to play uh, the role that the president wanted him them to play and then he was fired and the three military commanders were also fired or they left but that was a sign that they were not supportive of anything that wasn't following the democratic rules so uh, I have no reason 
to think or assume that they would be prepared to do anything. And as you might know, when Bolsonaro was attacking fiercely the electoral court and the electoral system and the electronic ballot box, I, I created a commission, a transparency commission, and I asked the Minister of Defense, please send me someone here inside the court to watch the entire process from the beginning of the program to the end of, of the totalization so that he can see. And why did I do that? First, because the military do help the election process in Brazil, distributing the ballot boxes all over the country. They were part of the team that conceived the electronic ballot box, but also because if you have a military here inside saying there was no foul play, there, was, there wasn't anything wrong, how can you use this argument to, to give a, a coup? And the interesting part is that the president, after I uh, appointed this commission, was, well, now I trust the system. <laughs> okay, that's fine, never too late. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, this point is very important, the role of the military, and I think they wouldn't support a, uh, a uh, coup. And finally, uh, Steve mentioned impeachment, and I, I want to say a word about that. Impeachment is not a solution that you can grab in a shelf every time a government becomes uh, unpopular. That, that's, that's a bad thing. And I think, and I've said that publicly, that uh, Dilma Rousseff's impeachment, uh, even if it wasn't a coup, it was a bad move. It, it harmed Brazil. It harmed the institutions because it was, and Steve has a, a chapter in his book, uh, I didn't know that word, it's for, 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 forbearance, right? Sometimes, even if you can do something, you shouldn't. So what they did was the president didn't have support in, in, the, in the House of Deputies, didn't have support in the Senate, so they impeached her. Not for corruption, of course, because to remove Dilma for corruption and put in place the people that got there, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, so, uh, it, was, it was a political move that was acceptable in a, in a parliamentary system with a vote uh, or a motion of disconfianza, distrust, probably. Uh, so, in, impeachment is something, it, it's an institutional fracture that we should avoid, even if we dislike the president who is in charge, be it Dilma or or Bolsonaro. And I think many people learn their lesson. You don't remove a president for that reason. Uh, and to be true, I am a semi-presidentialist uh, person. I think that we should follow a model like they have in Portugal, in which the president is elected by popular vote, has important competences, but state competences. Ordinary politics is for a prime minister. And if he loses support, you change the prime minister without affecting the stability of the system because the president is the guarantor of the stability and he has a fixed mandate. I think one day we're going to try that. But not as a political tool to avoid the next president. As an institutional move that will maybe, just maybe, release Latin America from this hyper-presidentialism that is the source of most of the crisis. And uh, Steve was describing, I mean, Fujimori, uh, Peron, you name it, wherever you go, presidentialism is a source of problems in Latin America. We need to find a different institutional uh, arrangement. So that's for the military and for 
impeachment. Uh, impeachment is always a trauma. And if uh, Dilma had concluded her time in office, I think the Workers' Party time in power would die naturally because there was a natural demand for alternation of power. But the way it was done, it created resentment and, and polarization. So we should take care uh, in using impeachment in, in Brazil and in, in, in Latin America generally. Uh, Steve? So the Chileans are at least considering a, uh, a semi-presidential system. I think it's not terribly likely that they'll opt for that, but they're, uh, they're, they're, they're debating it now as they're, as they're writing a new constitution. Um, it's, it's a a semi-presidential system is, is not widespread. It's, it's, it's complicated. It's mostly worked in pretty stable democracies, Portugal and France, but you're right. It does offer uh, a release, a way of peacefully institutionally removing uh, unpopular or ineffective governments while maintaining the stability of, of, a, of a fixed presidential term. The danger, of course, is um, potential serious conflict between a prime minister and a prime minister and a president, um, which I, it's thinking about, say, Peruvian politics or Ecuadorian politics is, it's not difficult, particularly in a fragmented party system, to imagine really crisis-ridden conflict between an elected president and a prime minister. But um, some kind of parliamentarization of presidential democracies has to occur. Some way of um, peacefully and, and legitimately removing failed presidents, particularly failed pre Because um, unfortunately, in much of Latin America, given weak states, extreme inequality, economic volatility, Crises are likely to be, um, you know, more or less routine events in much of Latin America in the decades to come. It's we're, it's, we're, it's not. Um, we have to expect that there are going to be periodic, relatively severe, social, economic, and political crises in much of Latin America, and that those kinds of crises weaken presidencies. And when those crises weaken presidencies, one or two years into a five or six year term there needs to be some kind of institutional response. And so far, the, um, I, would, I basically agree with you about impeachment. I have a slightly different take in that I think it's been used in Latin America, at least in some cases, as a, uh, I'll say in Spanish, as a mal menor, as an alternative that's better than a military coup. Uh, in a context of crisis where, the, where, correctly or not, the president is deemed you know, incapable of governing until the end of the term Whereas 40 years ago, the military would have stepped in and removed that president. In this case, the, the substitute is impeachment. It does weaken institutions, I agree with you. It's often politicized and, and damaging and polarizing. In some cases, it's, if the alternative is military intervention, it, it may be the, the, the Mao Menor. Right, well, I, I agree, but uh, that, that's worse than a tragic choice. <laughs> uh, military coup or, or uh, impeachment. I'm, I'm talking about constitutional solutions and impeachment uh, for good and for bad is a constitutional uh, solution. That's why I say, uh, I don't say there was a coup against Dilma. I, I just think it was hardball uh, uh, against her, to use a, an expression I, I heard from uh, Mark Tushnet uh, once in a talk here. Uh, and in Chile that Steve mentioned, is a very interesting experience. And then Chile right now, is, it's kind of a laboratory uh, for Latin America. But Chile is a much smaller country and much more homogeneous than, than Brazil. Things are easier in, in Chile. And something very interesting happened in Chile. They decided they would have parity between men and women in the, in the Constitutional Assembly, which was a, a great thing. And what happened is that they had to take out 14 women. Like more women were elected than, than, than men, uh, which is very interesting. In, in Brazil, we've been trying for years, and I tried myself very much with campaigns, to bring more women uh, to politics, which is very difficult for, for many reasons. It's very difficult. So 
we, 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 uh, Steve, uh, we have a law that reserves 30% of the, of the candidates or the candidacies for women. And now the, the electoral court is supporting to reserve not uh, can, candidates, but seats, actual seats, uh, at least 30% to start with, so that we can have some parity in, 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 in Congress, because uh, it, it's very unbalanced in, as, as, uh, as gender is, uh, is, is concerned. Uh, so, and we, we had important moves uh, in, in including black uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, candidates. We, we use in Brazil this black, this, the expression black. It's, it's pretty acceptable. I, I know here some people kind of uh, don't, don't agree with it. But uh, we had important the decisions at the electoral court to push uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, candidacies, which, which I think it was, was a good move. Uh, and we're coming to a close. What, what I would say uh, to you all, first, go back. <laughs> go back after you <laughs> uh, And I, I can tell you, if you allow me briefly, my, my I was here, uh, I was at Yale in 88, 89, and then I went to DC to work for, for a law firm. And I worked there for quite some time. But, at a certain point in 1990, I decided I wanted to go back to Brazil. I wasn't happy. Uh, life was very comfortable and people were very nice. But the problems that really concerned me, attracted me, were not here. They were in Brazil. My heart was there. My concerns were there. And I just wasn't happy here. And so I decided I'll go back. It was the color government, Steve. Uh, you're probably very young at that time, too. Everything was bad. Inflation was very high. Unemployment was very high. The exchange rate was terrible. The interest, interest rates were very high, meaning just like today. <laughs> <laughs> and, not, not even the football team was winning, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I never regretted my choice. Uh, Brazil is... is it's, uh, curious country because even when everything seems to be going in the wrong way it, it's still a wonderful place to be and you can make a difference there that you will never make here so i i would consider going back it's not that i don't have bad moments and disappointments i think uh we are not fighting corruption as we should i think unfortunately we stabilized in a very uh unsatisfactory uh, level. Uh, I think poverty and inequality is still a major issue that we haven't uh, tackled yet uh, enough. Uh, many people don't behave as they should, unfortunately, everywhere. Uh, but one thing that I learned, and it's kind of a solace uh, for myself and, and I'll share with you, is and, it, and it's, it's a good motto to live by. It's, it, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. You ought to play your part the best you can. And that's the best kind of freedom that there is. I'm playing my part the best I can. The universe protects us, I hope. <laughs> and uh, that, that's the only thing that makes, survive, makes me survive in Brasilia. <laughs> I thought it was constitutional <laughs> checks and balances. <laughs> so, uh, and this is very important because I, I see people that do evil things just because everyone is doing. Because evil is contagious sometimes. So this is an alert I, I would make. Don't follow people that are doing the wrong things, if you know what's the right thing to do. And uh, although it might not seem, that's what changes the world. That's what changes a country. And to end this, when I was in law school, my concerns were how to 
extinguished torture that was a stain in, 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 in the life of a country. How to overcome censorship, a time when people in power thought they could choose the books I could read, I could read, the news I could read, the music, the, the songs I could listen to. You wouldn't believe that. All songs had to be previously submitted to a federal censorship. That was the country in, in late 70s when I was in, in law school. And how to create democratic institutions in a country and in a continent where it was very hard for these institutions to have roots. Well, these days, although I'm concerned a little bit with some institutional issues, I am more concerned about how to improve basic education, how to convince people that knowledge, science, and technology is what we, we really need to invest in, in, and care about, how to improve public and private ethics in Brazil generally. So the quality of my concerns is much better today. And I like to emphasize this to uh, have the perception that we have moved in the, the right direction, although not at the speed we would like. But I think there is a major change going on in Brazil. What happened with the structural systemic corruption that we had, that we've had for 500 years, I would say, uh, it, it hasn't, we haven't overcome it. But nothing similar to what happened to Petrobras will happen again because people are watching. People have a new perception of things. So we change slowly, but we change. But we ought to push history in the right direction. And we need young, idealistic people to do that. What do you think, Steve? I agree wholeheartedly. One of the great dangers these days, because politics is so nasty, so polarized, so full of hardball, because the, the public sphere is so despised by many voters, is one of the great tragedies of that is that people like you are avoiding the public service, are avoiding going into government, are avoiding going into the state. And that would be the worst tragedy of all. The Brazilian democracy desperately needs you guys. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> is that okay, Jim? Thank you. Thank you. It's very good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.